I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome, everyone, to a special CHP episode. We're looking forward to this one for a while. I'm pleased to invite onto this long-running family program Mr. Larry Fain, who has a new book out, as they say in the biz, covering a subject I featured back in 2016, CHP 174 on the Pirate Queen, Cheng Yi Sao. Larry Fain's new book is called The Flower Boat Girl from Top Floor Books. It's been out in Hong Kong for a little while and is now available globally. I read it, and I can't wait to talk about it. Mr. Larry Fain, all the way from Lantau Island in the Hong Kong SAR, welcome to the China History Podcast. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Listen, before we start, I just want to mention this quickly. You know, back in the 1990s when I was living in Hong Kong, I took the bus every morning to my, from my uh, mid-levels flat to my office in Tokwa Wan. And as soon as I got to the Star Ferry on the Jim Sa Choi side, I'd buy a South China Morning Post. And as soon as I was seated on the 5C bus, I'd go straight to the world of Lily Wong and read your award-winning comic strip for that daily irreverent look at Hong Kong families and society. In all those years in Hong Kong, I never met you, but I still have my copy of Aya on my bookshelf somewhere. And here I am, a quarter century later featuring you as a guest on my my little China History Podcast program. <laughs> so nice to have you here. So just in case no one in our listening audience ever stooped to catch uh, a listen of my CHP 174 episode on Zhang Yi Sao, let's start off by introducing who she was. She was actually the most powerful pirate in history. But she didn't start out that way. She started out as a, from what I can tell, as a fisherman's daughter who ended up working the flower boats in Guangzhou. Uh, flower boats were floating brothels, which were very common in, in China, in, in most Chinese cities. And the most famous ones in China were in Guangzhou. And she was a prostitute on one of these flower boats for quite a few years. Then at some point, she was abducted by a pirate gang, and she was forced into marriage with their leader, who was uh, Zheng Yi, more accurately said, Zheng Ya. Then she, uh, she basically, at some point, realized that there's no going back, so she kind of immersed herself into the murky world of piracy, and um, eventually became an influence in, in Zhang Yi's fleet until at a certain point she was literally the brains behind his operation. And so, well, he, with her backing, then united all of the pirate fleets from the, of the South China coast, from the Vietnam border up to the Taiwan Straits, into one big confederation with him as leader, but her pretty much as the brains behind the whole thing. And together they instituted a system of protection passes for shipping for coastal villages, and became quite a considerable force. Then he died in a storm, and she then took over as leader. It wasn't as simple as that, but I'm just trying to give it in a nutshell. And so she led these pirates for the next several years as the absolute leader of the biggest pirate fleet ever in history. She had something like um, 1,500 ships, 18,000 men, you know, we think of Blackbeard as one of the most formidable pirates in history. At his peak, his peak, he had 20 ships and 500 under his command. So there's kind of a comparison for you. And then uh, she pretty much was in charge of the South China coast with her protection passes and this kind of system. She actually brought peace and stability to the coast where governments had failed for centuries. And then uh, at a certain point, she decided to retire, and she lived to a ripe old age of 69. And that, in a nutshell, is who she was, what she did, let's put it that way. I was more interested in who she was as a person, and that's what compelled me to write this book. 
And what what sources are out there? Did you all were, were there only uh, English language sources available? Did Chinese authors write about her in Chinese? The sources were when I first started looking into this story. The sources were few and far between. Uh, they're out there, but they just a lot of them hadn't really been put together. So, I mean, just to give you a little bit of background, I learned about this story from a sailor friend of mine. You know, I've lived on Lantau Island in Hong Kong for over 20 years, and an old friend of mine, Mr. Leung, is a sailor from the Taiyo boating community. You know, his family goes back generations, and one day he mentioned a folk song that his grandmother used to sing him about this lady pirate based in Dongchong on Lantau Island who had stood up to the navies of three empires and one. And so it presented her as kind of a folk hero. So I was extremely interested. What were the words of the song? Well, he didn't remember. So I was intrigued by this and I tried to find this song and I found other mentions by also by people from Taiyo community who had mentioned, oh yeah, I had an old relative who sang this song about the lady pirate, but I could never find the words and I still haven't found them. But by then, I was hooked on this story. So then, of course, I look online to find out what I can find about her. And there's all this sensational, swashbuckling stories that gave a picture of this really powerful woman who had been dragged aboard a pirate ship and and immediately punched out the pirate chief and said, if you want me, you have to give me a 50% share in your operation. And I want to be the, you know, your business partner. If you, if you want to have me. And he was so entranced by her that he gave in and so on. And I, at the time I was writing an article for a boating magazine here in Hong Kong. And I was writing an article about the pirates because I'd been gotten interested in this. And I based it on all this information I was finding on Wikipedia and other so-called reliable sources. And by the time I put together this story, it just didn't sit right with me. And I should point out that my background, I originally set out to be a historical novel writer. Back in college in America, I studied history under a, uh, an accomplished historian. It was a small college where everything was independent study. So I worked on, for two years, I worked on a historical novel based on the life of my grandfather who'd grown up in Azerbaijan. And I learned how to do historical research from my mentor. And one thing that he really taught me was how to develop my bullshit meter. And I I won't go into it, but he taught me various signs that certain things you're finding in your historical research are nonsense based on nothing. And so this is, I was getting that sense, something in the back of my skull, that bullshit sensor was starting to fire off. And I realized what I needed to do was what I'd been trained to do, trace the sources. So all these things I was reading, you hadn't done your podcast yet by that time, so that wasn't a source. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was back in around 2008. And as I traced the sources, they all went back to one source. And that was a, a history written by a Chinese civil servant who was kind of a, uh, an amateur historian whose name was Yun. Um, Was this 20th century, 19th century? No, no, no. He wrote it around 1832, 1833, which is 23 years after the pirates he was writing about had left the scene. But he had been posted to Guangzhou. He got interested in this. He did his research. And the story behind this is that there were certain accounts by foreigners about certain incidents that had occurred between the pirates and both these foreign navies and the Chinese Navy. So the Portuguese had written an account where they took credit for that they would have defeated these pirates if it wasn't for those incompetent Chinese naval ships. And the British wrote an account saying both the Portuguese and the Chinese were incompetent, and that's why the pirates got away. So this guy, he made his agenda clear right at the very beginning in the book that he wants to set the record straight and defend the honor and integrity and bravery of our great Chinese Navy. And so he wrote this book called, which was then translated into English by a German missionary and published in 1835, which he titled History of the Pirates Who Infested the China Sea. And every other page is 
defending the honor of the Chinese Navy. So he makes it, he makes no secret of the fact that he has an agenda here, a nationalistic agenda. When I picked apart what he wrote, the major events that he wrote about matched by date and even the, the general accounting with what the Portuguese and British had written and what other accounts had come up, like in magistrates' records in China. But in between, he filled in with conversations and thoughts and meetings that no one could have been privy to. But he wrote them as if they, they were real, that this was something he'd gotten from some source. And so it was kind of half fiction, half nonfiction. And I get it. What he was doing was trying to describe what was the motivation behind these pirates. But he, he made up all this stuff. And then what happened after that is the story, I guess it kind of languished for a while until it was discovered by some Westerners in the 1920s. And there was an American journalist named Joseph Gollum who wrote these kind of short human interest stories about interesting events and people from history that he would publish in pulp magazines. And he got a hold of this story, and he wrote his own version of it. And he didn't even give credit to this original source written by this guy named Yun. He gave credit to his neighborhood Chinese laundryman. Oh, I get some of my best material from him. Yeah. <laughs> it was published in 1926. So, you know, back then, that sort of racist portrayal of Chinese in America was pretty normal. But nevertheless, why that didn't discredit his credibility from the very beginning by anyone who read it, I don't know why. But he made up even more stuff. He's the one who made up this legend that she was taken aboard by the pirates and punched out the captain and demanded the share in his uh, operation. So he made up this whole fanciful thing, which he presented as a story for, you know, an interesting, true story for people to read. And it was then later compiled into a book collection of various short essays of his, not about pirates, but just general topics. And from then, the legend kind of took off. And so then what happens in historical research? Somebody, maybe it was a, a history student somewhere, read this story and then probably found the original 1835 document, the translation in English, and said, oh, they say the same thing. Therefore, it must be true. You know, you want to corroborate your sources, right? And so this is how her legend has built up over the years, even till today. Now, you asked about Chinese sources. Other than this one, there aren't really any. And that's because Chinese never glorified or romanticized pirates like Westerners do. And it's kind of surprising if you think about, like, the water margin, you know, the, uh, uh, what's it called? Shui Hu Zhuan. Shui Hu Zhuan, yeah. Yeah. So there, these bandits were, were made into heroes. And in fact, there is some reference that I believe is true where Zhang Baozai, how do you call him in Mandarin? Zhang Baozi. Um, Zhang Baozi. Zhang Baozi. He, he referenced the individuals when he was uh, making some kind of speech to the governor general of, of Guangdong province. But nevertheless, the Chinese never really romanticized bandits after the 14th century when that book came out. And so you didn't find anyone writing about them because they were interesting. The only Chinese sources I've ever seen were from magistrates' records from when pirates had been arrested and tried. And then it was just kind of, you know, it was a court document. That was written down. And so this guy, Yun, in the 1830s was the only one who really showed any interest in this story. So we don't really have the Chinese point of view about these pirates who were so powerful from around 1790 to 1810. Yeah, they were a historical scourge on the uh, China coast. Uh, even before then, they caused a lot of pain on the China coast for centuries. And emperors tried to deal with them, and uh, they were very hard to get rid of. Not only Chinese pirates, but Japanese pirates as well caused so much uh, pain and suffering along the coast. By the time these pirates came along, the government had pretty much given up. And that's another reason why they were so successful, and they kind of filled a vacuum. Because around this time, the emperor essentially didn't care. He It wasn't as big a problem as some kind of uprisings in the West and conquering new territories. And so the Navy was very underfunded. 
So if they lost three ships to pirates, they had the money to rebuild one. And so it really was kind of a, a vacuum for the pirates to operate in. So it was for pirates, this was their golden age. And that's why, like I said earlier, with their, by bringing in this system of passes and protection passes and protection fees for villages and ships, the actual violence and the raids and the, the theft and the kidnapping went way down because they were, they were just collecting these fees. And so ironically, the pirates under Jengi Sao brought peace to the coast for a while, which hadn't been there for 300 years. Oh, there's something to be said for extortion. You, uh, you, you use the uh, Cantonese pronunciation in your book. You don't call her Cheng Yi So. No, she's Cheng Yat So. And uh, Cheng Yi is Cheng Yat, Cheng Yat, Cheng Yat, and Cheng Po Chai. But that's because, I mean, this is another thing that at the very beginning of my research, I realized that's the first thing that's wrong. Why are they using Mandarin? Okay, I get it. This guy, Yun, he was from the north, and he wrote this story, and it was then translated and transliterated into Mandarin by this translator. And even with more current-day research, of course, the official language of academia related to China is, is Putonghua. But these people were not Mandarin speakers. They were Cantonese. They were boat people from the south coast of China. They spoke their own dialect of Cantonese. If they spoke any Mandarin at all, it would have been just very limited to some ty types of commerce. And I doubt that most of them spoke any Mandarin. So why are they given these Mandarin names? I, that's why in my novel, in The Flower Boat Girl, what I was trying to do was set the story straight and tell the true story of these people, which meant using transliterations of their real names in Cantonese and at the same time, I wanted to delve into their characters, and that's why it became a novel. But these people, the boat people, the, the Dan Ga, were the lowest class in China. They were like the, um, the untouchables in India. They were the only class of people in China who were forbidden by law from getting an education and therefore from getting a civil service job. So these were illiterate people. So they wouldn't have even... Was, was Danka, was that like a pejorative? Or is, it is was that, a pejorative. That, or, they, they considered themselves the, the water folk. There were a lot of pejoratives. Right? Yeah, they were, they were the boat people or the water folk or whatever. But Danka was, uh, was an insult term. And, you know, there's a lot of debate over what the origin of the term is. Currently, they say it means the egg people. Dan sounds like Dan. the word for egg. <laughs> If you look, there's so many different Chinese characters associated with the word. I don't really know what the original is. But in any case, you don't say it to someone's face that they're Danga. So who were they compared to wh whoever else was operating in the uh, South China Sea, Pearl River Delta? You had them. You had the Cantonese, the Bunte, Banti. Well, they kind of lived together, but, but they didn't really assimilate. So... The way their communities were set up, even until fairly recently in history, is, you know, the Bunde, the Punti that we say in English, you know, they lived on the land, they were farmers, and the boat people lived either on their boats right offshore or they lived in these kind of uh, stilt houses, these shanty houses. If you've ever been to Tai O or seen pictures of it, you can see that's how they live on the mud flats in these houses made of wood and bamboo. And so, you know, they would trade with each other, fish and vegetables and meats and stuff that they would trade back and forth. But there really wasn't much uh, intermingling between these communities. So the boat people really felt very put upon because they were forbidden from education. They were confined to a life of fishing, which is seasonal, or transporting goods, which was not steady work. And so they were very poor. And so a lot and they of them... Had a they had a hammerlock on the uh, prostitution business, uh, too, it seems. Yes and no. The, the flower boats, where, you know, which is where the prostitution was, a lot of it was took, taking place, especially in Guangzhou, they had two classes. The flower boats that had the land-based Chinese girls who had bound feet, a lot of them, they could charge more money. But the boat people, among other things that set them apart, was that their women never bound their feet. It made no sense because the women lived and worked aboard ship. 
and they had been absolutely useless with bound feet. So they never had bound feet. But as prostitutes, the ones with these these big boat feet obviously could take in less money. So they had two classes of flower boats. And so um, whether they had a, a stranglehold on the prostitution or not, I think is debatable. So there was a pirate raid, came to her village, Sun Woi, is that where it is? Xin Hui. We don't know exactly which village she came from. Xin Hui is the name of a town, but it's also a district. But it's in this kind of, at the time, it was the western delta, you know, it was kind of a web of waterways west of Macau. One of the five counties, uh, Hoi San, are uh, mm-hmm. from Xin Hui. So she was kidnapped, or somehow she ended up on uh, Zhang Yat's vessel. They got married, and then there was this magnificent wedding. How did you research all these minute details of the traditions, rituals? That was really a, a just a fabulous scene. Well, that's that they were wedding just loaded with detail. In fact, it was like three times as long, and my editors made me cut it down. Oh, it was beautiful. I did lots and lots of research, and that actually came from an eyewitness account of a boat people wedding. Uh, Even down to the ritual sayings and the jokes they were making, that was all kind of a, a script that they had to follow. This whole thing of the bride saying, oh, but I I can't be torn away from my family, enjoy my husband, and then saying, oh, but you must... And and there's a, there's a lot of this ritual, the way they change their clothes and the things they said and the ritual of making offerings to the parents at the main mast. All this came out of, of a couple of eyewitness accounts to boat people weddings that I found. That was quite a find. One was an eyewitness account written in the 1930s by a, a very interested Englishman living in Hong Kong who made it his hobby to the traditions of the local people. And others came from the 19th century. All right, so there's plenty of BS. Uh, How much of it is true, we'll never know, but uh, it's certainly suspect. What did you find out during the course of your own research in writing this? Well, I made a few discoveries that I was even kind of shy about. I was getting a lot of help from the two leading experts on the pirates of that time, Diane Murray and Robert Antony, who'd both done some really groundbreaking research. But neither their interest was in presenting the story of these pirates as a narrative. It was more looking at specific issues about, you know, sociological issues, issues about weaponry and hardware. Robert Antony was very interested in how the weather affected piracy along the coast, which was a very interesting sideline. I was constantly consulting with both of them. They were very generous with me. And then I made a couple discoveries that neither of them had ever come up with. And, I, and I'll tell you one. Um, and this was about the pirates going to Vietnam to fight in a, in a civil war there. And this is the known. The Taysan Rebellion. That's right. This is known. They did that. In 1790, they first went to port the Taysan side in the north against the uh, invaders from the south. And they were there for 12 years. And then later in 1801, and that's where my book comes in, they were again recruited to go fight for the, the Taysan side because there was a saying, and I, I found this, that, um, that they had, that it was called Annam at the time, not Vietnam. The Annamese made great ships and terrible sailors. And so it's true, they built these beautiful mahogany ships out of this dark wood, but then they recruited these, these hard fighting men and women who were used to doing things just for money, and that meant Chinese pirates, to run their navy. So they had this mercenary navy that was based in a border town called Changping, and and that and then they fought for them, and then later they were found back in Chinese waters. And this is all that we knew, according to the sources. So I delved deeper. I found a reference, not even in the main text, but in one of the footnotes in Diane Murray's book about the pirates, that this group of pirates had been spotted in the Spirit River in central Annam or Vietnam on such and such date. And that's all. That's all it said. Nothing else. And so I looked up the date and it turned out to be Chinese New Year or Tet, as they call it there. See, that this is all that, that we knew. So I realized, okay, I've got to f- find some Vietnamese histories of this time. 
And those are very hard to find in translation, but I found a couple. And I discovered this entire narrative that I pieced together, not because it was written the, that the Chinese pirates did this and that. They were in the Spirit River. On that date, the Annamese emperor came to the Spirit River to throw a banquet for his troops that were lined up there getting ready for a move into the south to retake the old capital of Hui. And in the wee hours of that night, there was a surprise attack by the rebels helped by French forces and French weaponry to massacre the enemies, the Taesan side. And many ships were destroyed. And all this is in the Vietnamese histories, none of them referring to these ships as being manned by Chinese pirates or mercenaries, but just describing this. And I found other little bits and pieces. I was able to put together an entire narrative of what these pirates had done during these few months in late 1801, early 1802, in support of the or the Taysan side in this anime civil war. And all that went into the book. And I asked uh, Robert Anthony, the professor at the University of Macau, I said, look what I found. Am I allowed to do something with this? I'm not a credentialed historian. He said, well, <laughs> you, you made a discovery. He said, you know, not everything is known yet. That's why we still have historians. And you made a discovery. So... I made a lot of other smaller discoveries, but that was my big one. And so it not only gave me an interesting historical narrative to add to the novel, but it really filled in a lot in exploring her motivations and the subsequent things that happened with her and with them. And so I could really go more deep into her character, which is what I was really looking to do with this book by using this whole string of incidents in Anam. We know her name, or we assume her name, Shi Yang or Sek Yang, Shi Xianggu. How do we know that was really her name? Is that I don't know where this Xianggu came from. That one I dismiss entirely. I think that was in one reference somewhere. Yeah, I don't know how we know her name or the fact that she was born on a specific date in 1775 in Xinhui. Somewhere that came out. I don't know. I think. It's pretty much agreed that was her name. Her name was Shek, Shek Young, or I noticed that my boat people friends in Taiyo with their dialect said her name is Shek Yang, or somewhere in between Yang and Young, kind of like <laughs> Yang. So I liked that. It looked better when I was writing the book to call her Yang, spelled Y-A-N-G. I believe there's a, a consensus on that being her name. All right, well, 1801, she married Zhang Yi, the great-great-grandson of Kaxinga, Zhang Chenggong. Yeah, that was really interesting that he did come from this whole dynasty of, uh, of pirates. Oh, yeah, that was and, the most famous one. And his father and his uncle, they were, they were from Fujian, and his father and his uncle in the mid-18th century moved down to what's now Hong Kong. And so his base was set up in, in Leiyumun, which is in eastern Hong Kong Harbor, and his uncle set up in Dongzhong here on Lantau Island. And so his cousin, Cheng Chat, grew up in Dongzhong. He grew up in Leiyumun. And so um, they were, well, they were the last of that dynasty, I guess you could say. He was quite a character. You really brought uh, Zhang Chat, uh, Zhang Qi, you really brought him to life. He was, he was something else, him and his wife, great characters. Zhang Bozai, you paint him as quite a dandy, quite a uh, colorful guy. Again, here's someone where there's a lot of legends about him, especially in Hong Kong area, where he's, he's the one who's kind of the folk hero. This also goes back even to that original Chinese document where he's presented as the head of the pirates and she's just the wife. I mean, that's basically the sexism of the time, that because by the time that the pirates were powerful, he was kind of the front man, the colorful front man, and she was the one who would sit in the back room planning everything. So he was he was the one everyone saw. But he was there's legends about him doing these supernatural feats of like lifting uh, heavy idols that he was trying to steal that no one could pick up. And he was considered very flamboyant. And it turns out that a lot of that is true. If you look at quite a few of the Chinese accounts, and even some of the Western accounts, they talk about how he's always dressed in these bright purple robes, and he was clearly bisexual, and he was someone who was also very eloquent. 
in the few accounts that we have of actual transcripts of things he said, which I believe are probably valid, you know, he speaks very colorfully. He started out as, well, as a fisherman's son who was abducted by Jing Yat when he was about 14, and he became Jing Yat's catamite, his male concubine. And that's another kind of interesting side story, because among the pirates, I mean, not just pirates, but many boat people, but especially among the pirates, homosexuality was kind of a, a requirement. It was, you know, it was kind of a, for, for a captain who had certain standing in the community, it was sort of a trophy to have a young boy who would sleep with him. And I can even, I even found Chinese accounts where they, they actually had the rules set out of the relationship, like who's on top, for example. So what, the way this worked was that these captains, especially ones without a son, would choose a young boy, usually between 10 and 13 or 14 years old, who showed some promise to perhaps be a leader in his own right when he got older. And he would take in that person as a protege or as an apprentice to train him. And at the same time, he became the bed partner. And that was standard practice among these pirates. And so later, what would happen is if they did live up to their practice, and if the captain still didn't have a son, or if he had a son that he didn't think was up to the job, then these boys would be officially adopted as a, as a son. And this was the case with Zheng Bozai, that he had been taken in. He obviously was had quite a flamboyant personality. He had this charisma. He was very good looking, apparently. So he was taken in as Zheng Yat's catamite. And so, therefore, he was her rival for her husband's bed. And, and her adopted son and, as well. Her adopted son, who she later then married and, and made her not just her marriage partner, but her partner in, in business. So, you know, some of those details in the book about that relationship were pure speculation on my part about the development of their relationship. But like everything else in this book, I was working my hardest to make it plausible. And this kind of brings up another thing about writing a historical novel rather than a biography. I'd spent five years just on the research, not knowing what I was going to do with all this stuff. I was just fascinated. I was gathering as much information as I could. I had stacks of documents, and these historians who I was consulting with were very generous in giving me some of their documents. And my original intention was to write a biography of her and set the record straight. But the problem was, even with all the research I was doing, a lot of it was one-sided, and there were big gaps in the history. And I set out to fill those gaps by extrapolating from other known sources. So, for example, her abduction, it's the chapter one. She's abducted from the, her village. A very exciting opening. Well, I'll give you, this is an aside. That was from an eyewitness account that I heard. Really? You know, this was, this was another one of my serendipitous discoveries. Because my wife and I, you know, we lived on Lantau Island since long before there was an airport or a development in Tung Chung. And we used to hike to Tung Chung a couple, one or two times a month. It was about a, a two hour hike. And one day we decided we were always on the same path. Let's try a, try a side trail and see if, how it brings us there. So we took this side trail, which brought us down a steep slope into a very dense forest. And then the trail just stopped and we were lost and it was too steep to walk back uphill because the, the path was very sandy and we just kept slipping. So we had to forge ahead and we were just totally lost. And we came across this old woman in the forest, just like Hansel and Gretel. And she was stooped over gathering leaves and twigs and putting them into basket. And so we asked her, you said, we're lost. Can you point us to how to get back to Tong Chong? And she said, oh, yeah, okay, you help me carry my baskets back to my village, and I'll, I'll show you how to get there. So we're walking along. She said that she was gathering these twigs and leaves to make some medicine for her husband, who was sick. So my wife asked her, oh, how old are you? And she said, I don't remember the exact number. It was like 87 or 88 years old. But this was around 2010. The wheels started going in my brain, and I did the math. Now, back in the 1930s was the last big wave of piracy in this region. Really? 1930s? It was 1930s, still going on? That's right. And wow. there was a big wave of piracy in 
Macau and and Hong Kong across the Pearl River Delta, which was finally snuffed out by the British Navy. But places like Lantau Island were total backwaters. There was no road, obviously. There were no regular ferry services. And so these pirates picked on villages and shipping and fishing in these outer islands. And it was a, it was a big problem. So I asked this woman, I said, you know, she must have been a little girl in the 1930s. So I asked her, did you see any pirates? And she gave me this funny look and, and then said to me, how does the Guaylo know about pirates? And she said, yeah, they raided my village. And she told me the story of the raid. And most of what she told me went into that first chapter verbatim. They, wow. These pirates pulled in in their sailing junks. Like, I don't know, I don't remember how many junks, but maybe three three to five. And they came into the village and they were hauling away all the, the women and the young boys and several houses were set on fire. They were stealing goods. Finally, her mother hid her under the kitchen stove. And so she escaped being taken away. She witnessed all this and she told it all to me. And this was like gold for me. Here I was researching these pirates and certainly in the 1930s, considering what a backwater Lantau was at the time, it couldn't have been much different than 120 years earlier. And so that's where a lot of that came in. And also I'd read accounts of other raids uh, on coastal villages that had been written more in that time period. Again, this was something we don't know definitely that she was abducted. By putting all the pieces together together, it occurred to me that that was the most likely scenario. There's some accounts you'll read online where the pirates came and they grabbed her off one of the flower boats. That's impossible. The flower boats were these pirates' clients, right? They were in the, the human trafficking business. They sold girls to these agents who sold them on to the flower boats. They weren't going to go and wreck one of their clients' businesses. So there's no way she was abducted from there. So the only way I could figure is that she had probably paid off whatever indenture that had been incurred when she was sold off by her family. And it probably, instead of going into the business, like most of these young women who would pay off their indentures, they would invest their money in because they had no other options. She must have just left. And she must have gone back either to her home village or some other village. And from there, she was abducted. We don't know for sure, but after considering all the possibilities I came to the conclusion that's the most likely scenario. And the reason I'm saying this is because, again, when I was, uh, when I was writing this novel, I had another mentor who was, a, was an author of historical novels. And I asked her, how much can I make up? And she said, well, you make up what you have to. And the rule that she followed that she got from her mentor was don't contradict what is known. If you have all these historical events, don't switch the order, even though it might have made a a more exciting story, and don't change the actual events that you do know about. And the things you make up should be plausible, not these fantastic things, unless you're setting out to just to write an entertainment. And so this became my mission. I couldn't write a biography because I had to fill in these gaps. I could fill in the gaps to the best of my ability by doing further research into what most likely happened. And that would be best presented in a novel. And then at the same time, by the time I was through with five years of research, I was a lot more interested in not just the events of what she did or what the pirates did, but what kind of person was she and were these other pirates? And I wanted to explore her psychology. And that too is something that you do best in fiction. And so this is why it ended up being a novel rather than a nonfiction book. So let me ask you, was there any problem being a man and writing this novel in first person with a female protagonist? No. In fact, well, for one thing, I've only ever written about female protagonists. The comic strip that you mentioned that I did in the world of Lily Wong for for about 15 years, that was about a Chinese woman, a working class Chinese woman in, in Hong Kong and her foreigner husband. And everyone assumed this was autobiographical, and I was him, and Lily Wong was my wife. No, it's the opposite. I'm sorry. Lily Wong was my alter ego. If I was in a good mood, she was in a good mood. If I was angry about something, she got angry about something. And 
without being too confessional, this goes way, way, way back in my life where I've always been more interested in how women think. And I mean, even in high school, I was the one guy who was allowed to hang out with the girls. I was one of the girls. And <laughs> all totally platonic, right? Which was very frustrating to me. But they, I, I always found it was much easier for me to talk to women than to men. And so I was much more interested and in tune, I think, with women. And I do my research. When I did the comic strip, one of my most popular series was when my protagonist, Lily Wong, got pregnant. And I busted my butt going around interviewing as many women as possible from as many, as many cultures as possible about what they went through with pregnancy, what kinds of foods they weren't allowed to eat, what kinds of things they weren't allowed to do. And all this went in there. So by the time that series was done, I became, I was inducted as an honorary member of the American Women's Club and, <laughs> and so on. And so when it came to writing this book, one of my original ideas was to alternate the views between her and Jung Bo Zai. But when I tried writing about him, I found I just wasn't interested in a man's point of view. And so I was fortunate, of course, because my wife is Chinese and she's a psychologist. So I would consult her a lot about the psychological aspects of this character, about her personality type, and about a Chinese woman's point of view. And just recently, I went to give a talk at the Hong Kong uh, Museum of Art bookshop. And one of the women from the Museum of Art gave me the ultimate compliment. She came up to me, and the first word she said to me was, you really understand women. So I guess I passed the test. That, uh, you did a good job. Yeah. So, um, yeah, of course, people are going to be resistant at first. Even I'm resistant when I read books by people of either gender who are writing from the other gender's point of view. But if it's well written, you get into the character and you forget about who's the author. So I, I do believe that perhaps I accomplished that. So what else allowed you to get inside the head of uh, Zheng Yisao, of her character? Well... I'm not sure what, what helped me get inside her character, but I felt at a certain point that like I was channeling her, that this was my, my mission to kind of bring her back to life and to set her story straight and to do her honor. And I really felt connect with her. And I felt, I felt a connection, but I, I felt a genuine connection with her. I used to go, well, I still go to, um, to Tayo and Lantau Island. Which, is, which was, even until recently, a smuggler's haven, even up until the handover. So this was a place the pirates used to go to trade goods, and there's no question about that. So these pirates certainly would have been regular visitors to Tayo. And in Tayo, in the center, there's two temples next to each other, and one is a Tinhao temple. And Tinhao mm -hmm. was the, uh, you know, Mazu, was, was right. the, uh, the goddess of seafarers. And every ship had a had a Tinhao shrine on it, and everywhere they went, these pirates or sailors would build Tinhao temples. So when they came to Tai, oh, there's no doubt in my mind that they would have gone to this temple. The temple there is 400 years old. It was there at the time these pirates were coming in. It may have been rebuilt since then, but it was always there in that place. And inside, there are some artifacts that are older than that. So for sure, they came in there. So while I was researching this, I would occasionally go to Tayo and go visit that temple alone to uh, commune with their spirits. Because it was the one place I knew I could go where I was standing in the same place where she must have stood. And so the first time I did that, once I started this project, I had a really strange experience. I made sure no one else was inside. My wife waited outside. And I went around the, the altar table to face the Tin House statue. And immediately I felt as if I had dropped into cold water. You know, that really, I was surrounded by this chill feeling. And my arms were pinned to my side. And I couldn't, I literally couldn't move. And I had this sense of a woman's voice or more than one woman's voice screaming at me, not hearing them, 
but the sense that you would feel if someone's screaming at you. And, you know, the best I can describe it as is a voice from, from beyond that wasn't in my ears, but was resonating throughout this, this little temple. And it was really frightening. And I sincerely, I couldn't move. And I, I stood there and thought, just, just let it be. Although I was a little bit scared. And eventually it subsided and I came out of there. And I told my wife about it. And neither of us is superstitious in any way. Right? And she grew up even rejecting a lot of these Chinese uh, worship rituals. But she said, I think you have to be careful with what you're writing. And that made me even more determined to get everything right and to show proper respect. And so in the intervening years, I'd go there once in a while, and the same thing would happen. Not because I was expecting it, but a very similar feeling. But then the most powerful experience came back in January, a few weeks before the book was going to be released here in Hong Kong. And I was feeling a bit nervous in many ways because, look, I, I felt like I'd been living inside this character for so long. And I was about to bring her back to life. I was dredging these people up from their graves in a certain respect, in a metaphorical sense. And bringing them to life again. And how would they feel about it? So I purposely made another trip to Tayo, and my wife came along and she waited outside again. I went in. And this time it was, it was a much more powerful experience. Again, I was kind of anticipating that cold feeling, but this time I walked in and it was like I was being slapped around. I felt such rage at me. And of course I couldn't interpret what this rage feeling was, but my guess was that if you're going to believe in spirits, that they were angry at me for taking their stories and, and capitalizing on it. So I dropped to my knees and I begged their forgiveness and I spoke out loud that I'm doing this to honor you. I am not trying to use you to make money. A book like this is not going to make money. That's what Dan Brown said. Yeah. I mean, this, this was not my purpose. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent 13 years on it, right? Uh, I, just, I said, I'm doing this to honor you. I'm doing this to reintroduce you to the world in, in a way that shows respect. They may have been criminals. The way they lived their their lives, especially what she did, is make the best of the most awful, shitty situations in life and to make herself into something. That was something absolutely worthy of the greatest respect in the world. And so I said this, and that really intense, hostile feeling kind of subsided. And a different feeling took over, which was more like as if they were kind of folding their arms saying, yeah, yeah, all right. You know, it wasn't, there was no warmth of, oh, that's wonderful, thank you. It was just like, yeah, 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 okay, just go ahead then. I mean, I, this, well, is, this is how I felt. I was really shaken up, and I, I came out of there, and I figured maybe 10 minutes had gone by. My wife said, what hell happened? You were in there for 45 minutes. And <laughs> so I told her all this, and I said, do I release the book or not? It's not too late to cancel it because I don't want anything to happen to me. Again, I'm not superstitious, but how can you not have certain feelings like that when you have such an experience? And so I've decided, you know, I decided to go ahead, of course, and I do occasionally offer a bit of uh, meditation. I wouldn't call it prayer, but just meditation in their direction, saying this is respect respect and so maybe it's true that i did come in touch with her spirit per her spirit the voices i told you about were definitely female and um that's really all i can say and i and i hope that in the flower boat girl that sense of respect for who she was and what she made of her life comes through loud and clear well I think we've gone on long enough. I guess who's to yeah. say 
how much of the story of this colorful character from Chinese history is true and accurate. I guess you could say that about almost anything that happened in world history prior to the 18th century or certainly the 17th. But no matter how much of uh, Zhang Yatso's story is true, as presented in your book, The Flower Boat Girl, or otherwise, it's truly one of the great stories and legends from the thousands of years of Chinese history. And I'm so glad that I had the chance to chat with you about it. You know, reading the book was really a joy. You know, you, you've lived in Hong Kong for so many years now, decades, and, you know, you were able to convey so much of that historic Pearl River Delta ethos and pirate bandit culture. I mean, I just can't say enough uh, good things about this. Thank so you. anyway, I think we both need to send some good loving to my, uh, in the direction of my man in Dali, Yunnan province, Mr. Alec Ash, yes. for bringing us together. What a swell guy he is on uh, so many levels. Thanks, Alec. I'm going to uh, put all the uh, important uh, book links in the show notes at the uh, Teacup Media website. So I hope you follow through with an audiobook version of the uh, book. Are you going to th- considering doing that? Well, I've been uh, searching for the, the right actress. I think I found her. She's really expensive. And well, maybe you could uh, get a Kickstarter going yeah, or something. I'm, I'll, I'm uh, looking be into happy ways. to uh, promote it. Well, if hundreds of thousands of people buy the printed book, then I can afford to to pay for this actress because this this is all a uh, self produced production, and that was on purpose. I I didn't even offer it to publishers or agents just because I'm quite aware of how the publishing scene has changed. I prefer to have total control over the production. So I'm looking for a way to produce an audio book. But um, if people are intrigued, if they go to my book website, uh, piratequeenbook.com, you can get a free sample chapter with some historical notes and decide for yourself whether you're interested in this book. So I just wanted to put in that plug. I'll have that uh I'll have that link at the show notes and if we ever emerge fully from this stubborn pandemic I sure hope some uh movie studio uh makes a film of this epic story it's such a natural and who doesn't like pirate movies Disney can attest to that didn't didn't uh, she get written into the uh what was it the second or the third uh, the Pirates third of the one. Caribbean movie yeah, uh, she yeah. she got a Chow Yun Fat was Jung Bo Zai, and I forget who oh, played really? her, but they showed her as this old crone, uh, which is absolutely absurd. Not that they were trying to be accurate in any way, but by the time she was an old crone, she was long retired. Yeah, this is what happened. You know, there was a movie, a totally execrable movie made of this oh, story no. in Italy in 2007. Uh, explains it. <laughs> it's called Singing Behind Screens, and... It was filmed on the Dalmatian coast. Doesn't at all look like the China coast. And <laughs> they they based it on that, pretty much on that story I told you by the American journalist, Joseph Gollum. But they went even farther. First of all, they put two Italian sailors in charge. So there were these bearded Italian sailors telling the pirates what to do. And her job, she was played by a Japanese actress who couldn't act her way out of a paper bag. But she spoke fluent Italian, and she, she'd grown up in, in Italy, so that was her qualification. So her role in the film was to pose on the upper deck in, in beautiful robes holding a sword, and then later to go inside the cabin and take her clothes off. And so that was essentially <laughs> her, her role on the Pirates. And the movie won an award for costumes. It was absolutely the worst treatment of this story that, that has ever been done. Okay, Mr. Larry Fain, this was truly a great pleasure, and I know this book is going to do well. I can't recommend it enough to anyone who appreciates Qing-era Chinese history. Thanks again for coming on the CHP for this special episode. It's my honor to be invited onto such a well-informed show. It's one that that I look to for information, and so to be on here is kind of uh, humbling for me. Well, you are definitely too kind. 
Okay. I thank each and every one of you for tuning in. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California. Please consider coming back next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.